Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Those of you who have seen and watched last night's session with Dr. Francis Sue on faith and science, we are so excited that you guys are able to join us. We know we had a lot of awesome questions that people were asking from the evening. And so we will now have a chance to talk with Francis live. So if we can say hello to Francis and welcome him on to the, uh, the time with us. And, and please have your questions ready to go. We have the, the questions that were, that were posted by people and you guys have ranked them and you feel free to ask other questions in the comments as well, or just make any comments in the comment section. We'll be, we'll be happy to try. Now there's a lot of, so far there's 18 questions that are posted, so we can't guarantee we can get through them all, but we will try our best to cover as much as possible. So first, thank you so much, Dr. Sue, for, for joining us. We really appreciate all of your time and effort and fantastic talk that you gave us yesterday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's really great to, to be with you all. Yeah, just just awesome. Literally loved what you were talking about yesterday on the transcendence of the dignity and beauty and of truth. And uh, it was it was a wonderful way that you packaged all of that and how it impacted your faith. So awesome stuff. Yeah, so we'll get right into it. You know, the the top question we had several, several big questions. But we, we, we felt like one of these main questions that is uh, really important and kind of the focus of, I think, a lot of what, what Dr. Sue was talking about is this first one at the top here. It says, is faith, is faith the, or does faith provide a different view about cause and effect? What exactly does faith mean? For example, believe in the existence of God, love of God, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's a that's an interesting question. I you know I saw that in uh, in uh, in in uh, Slido, and I I'm not exactly sure what uh, what the question was getting at, but I'll, I'll I'll venture a guess. You know, if if you think a little bit about what what faith uh, what faith means, what faith is, it's you know it's it, in 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 many ways it's it's a it's a hope uh, that we have uh, that. Um, uh, that there is more in, in some sense to the world than just what we see. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, it's um, the evidence of, of things hoped for um, uh, in, in some ways. And, uh, and so, you know, what, what I, the way I like to think about it is, 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 is exactly that. It's, it's uh, a hope, you know, in terms of, you know, when I think about what it means to, um, to live a life of faith, it's, it's really living a life of hope. And when I talk about what it means to share uh to share um this hope that i have with others you know that's that's part of what this conference is all about is 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 thinking about what it means to share the hope that we have um uh with others so uh i i don't know that it gives me a, a different view of cause and effect than than might otherwise be you know the then a scientist might think about it um i, I mean it does give me uh uh, some uh, some confidence that I know you know the ultimate story of of uh, of uh, the universe and the ultimate story of, of humankind is uh, is going to uh, is going to be one that has hope. I don't know how, how would you answer that question, George? Oh wow! <laughs> well, yeah, I I do not proclaim myself as an expert, but I am. Neither do I, by the way. I, you know, <laughs> We're, we're just we're just sharing as as uh, people and fellow travelers. I, I mean, we yeah. have degrees, but we we're also uh, just uh, working our way through this world, just like everyone else. Yeah. Well, I, I'll say this: I really appreciated what you shared yesterday, and I think that I resonate what you shared yesterday. That that science is basically kind of helps us to understand the way things work. Right, but faith answers those questions that science cannot under that that science is not very good at answering, which is like how do we love, and and what is the purpose of life, or what is the meaning of life, right? These these questions that are that that are beyond science or a, a science experiment or something like that, right? So, I really liked your view about that as as how 
we can both have science and faith together and they're not incompatible as some people might believe. Mm -hmm. So I think faith really, faith is, is integral to really having a kind of complete worldview, more of a, more of a complete world picture than trying to just say, I'm going to be only relying on faith or only on science. So yeah. I really see it as a, as a, as a wonderful way of, bringing both in and they're they're totally compatible in my opinion yes yeah yeah and I, I would agree with that I mean uh, I think one of the questions gets to this was asking like uh, uh, is there some way that am, am I just using faith to fill in uh, the gaps that science can't answer and and I, I actually want to sort of move away from thinking about it that way because you know it's it's not like uh, just because I I don't understand how uh, the wind works, I'm going to attribute that to uh, to God's influence. It's more of, as you said, having a more complete view of the world, right? I can have an explanation for how water boils, but that's not going to be the same kind of explanation as uh, I might have for uh, why the water was boiling, uh, yep. and, uh, what yep. I what I was boiling the water for. I you know I was boiling it to make tea or whatever it is, you know. So. Uh -huh. Uh, having a more complete picture is, is maybe a way of thinking about uh, uh, about what what faith does. It answers different questions uh, than, yes. than the science does. Yes, and and to the to maybe that second half of that question, what exactly does faith mean? I mean, and they put belief in the existence of God. I would say, yeah, it definitely depends on your worldview, right? And and. My personal worldview is that Jesus is Lord. So yes, it to me faith means believing in Jesus, right? And to me it means placing my faith in Him. And but it's not without investigation. You know, I think it's it's because I've investigated because because we've thoroughly looked through scriptures and evidence to arrive at that that uh, that step of faith. And and it's. It's science that has helped me personally, and I, I, I believe you as well, to, to reach that place where we, you know, science has kind of helped me close the gap of, of doubt, right? And then it will mm -hmm. always be a step of faith. Faith will never be proven. That's why it's called faith, right? But yeah. Yeah, science has helped me to close that gap and helped me to make it easier for me to say, yeah, absolutely, that is true. How about you? How, do, how, has, how has that been for you? And what does faith mean to you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's, that's uh, sort of critical here for me is, uh, is the story of Jesus Christ and uh, what I understand uh, about him and his life and, and who he was and who he said that he was. Uh, and so, you know, that the, in, in many ways, this is, it's a historically grounded uh, uh, belief system, right? It's, it's not just that I, you know, believe something, uh, metaphysical right anybody can have a metaphysical belief but uh when i understand when i read uh in scriptures and i understand uh, something about who jesus was uh that's very compelling to me uh yeah that, um uh that we have uh, 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 uh this figure who seems almost strangely you know uh um self-sacrificial but also um uh but also you know uh, both human and, and divine, right? That's kind of a, a, a an interesting um, paradox to, to to think through, and you know, it's completely different in many ways from other other kinds of religions that um, uh, that aren't as uh, aren't don't don't base themselves in a historically grounded event. Yes. So you know, for that, for me, that I think that's that's central, and then of course. You know, God giving us the ability to use our minds to reason, to think. Um, I think that's that's also um, an important part of how we make sense of the world and how we move through the world. And uh, and um, and so, you know, part of what I do as a scientist, uh, I think it it increases my appreciation for the beauty and the magnitude and the wonder of 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 uh, the, cre the creation uh, as we as we see it. Uh, and so that's. That, you know, that's uh, also uh, a way in which my faith, uh, my science, the, the way I practice science also uh, contributes to my life of, of faith. Speaking of faith and, and kind of 
how you how faith has contributed to your to your field. We have the next top question is as a professor in a STEM field, how have colleges, students, and other academics responded to your faith? What are the best questions they have asked you? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, so I mean, I, I think one thing that's that seems to be true, at least in my experience, is that uh, that the sciences in in the STEM fields, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, I, I have not encountered a, a lot of resistance to um, to my own personal um, uh, my own personal uh, uh, expressions of faith and. Uh, you know, that may be kind of surprising because you often hear uh, of this model of, you know, it's it's uh, Christians against uh, the world in some sense. And I haven't found that to be the case. I think people are generally respectful uh, of uh, others' beliefs. And I would hope that that's true of everybody. I would hope that's true for Christians um, being respectful of, of, of uh, our colleagues and, uh, and our students and, and their own uh, and their own faith uh, traditions. Uh, and so that that enables us to have dialogue, I think, in, in ways that are are uh, wonderful and, and refreshing. Uh, in in my own uh, in, in my own journey as a as a as a professor, you know, one of the the ways that um, faith topics often comes up is in informal conversations, right? So, um, you know, I'm in a carpool with a bunch of professors because we this is Los Angeles, and you know, many of us live about 30 minutes from where we actually work, right? So. Uh, you know, that's that's like conversations around the water cool, cooler, right? And and often, you know, we we get got gotten into topics that are both superficial and sometimes very deep, right? Uh, you know, superficial might be, uh, uh, you know, just topics around like you know why it is that, you know, I go to church or you know things like that. But you know, deeper questions often arise when people share, you know, difficulties they've had, right? I've, you know, I've sometimes talked about my own uh, journey uh, in many of the, the, the difficulties that I've faced um, personally, personal crises. Uh, others have opened up about their own personal crises and, and asked some questions, hard questions, like, you know, why why would, in your view, why would God allow suffering, right? And mm -hmm. that's often opened, opened up really, uh, really good conversations. So another question that has come up in the carpool is, you know, questions about uh, justice, right? So there's a lot of, uh, especially in the U.S. these these days, with um, conversations around racial justice, right? Yeah. Uh, conversations around the environment, and so you know, often my colleagues find it really surprising that I actually um, care a lot about the environment and that I uh, see care of the environment as part of the um, uh, a part of the, the call that I that that I believe God has. Had Absolutely, called us to steward uh, the creation, and so yes. that's uh, uh, you know those are often ways in which faith uh, conversations arise. Absolutely, that's that is great. Yeah, and 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 I think uh, I think in each of our fields, there there God is everywhere, and so like just as an example, you know, I, I teach design at the University of Houston, and and. The topics I don't I don't even need to bring it up. It brings it up itself. Like I teach a class on biomimicry, and you know, bios means life, and mimicry means to mimic or copy, right? And so, just in my field of design, we are we are observing God's creation and trying to learn from it and see how we can apply it to our designs, mm -hmm. right? And already, people just through that observation get excited about like the the best designer in the universe which is god right and so i and for me anyway i i haven't needed to even like you know beat him with any kind of book it's it's already god is already there and i just kind of help point them to say hey there's an amazing designer here yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we can just observe all of his amazing creation yeah. and learn from it and apply it to our field of design right yeah yeah, I mean, I, I and I, I think I, I love the way you talked about that. I mean, I think it, in every field, there's there's some uh, deep questions that uh, often often uh, you don't have to go too far before they become spiritual questions, right? Yeah. In in some ways, like and I, you know, in the classroom, if, you know, if, if I'm introducing uh, the real numbers and I, I'm having, you know, one of my classes, I actually build the real numbers up from first principles, right? Yeah. 
And uh, I like this quote by a mathematician named Kronecker who said, uh, God created the integers, all else is the work of man. And now, of course, you know, I, I just invite my students to think a little bit. I say, what do you think Kronecker meant by that? You know, there's, there's an interesting question, right? Whether or not you have religious faith or not, Kronecker is expressing a view. Uh, God created the integers. So that's like the numbers, you know, counting numbers, one, two, yeah. three, and all the negative numbers, right? And then he's saying everything else is, is man's creation. So there's an interesting philosophical question. Well, what do you mean everything else is man's creation, right? Like, like if, uh, if, you know, is a fraction two fifths a creation of man? Or if I encountered an alien, you know, society somewhere else, wouldn't they also have fractions? So, you know, aren't fractions universal? Like what's created and what's discovered? That's often a, an interesting philosophical question. It gets, you, know, you can get a whole, uh, a bunch of people to, to, uh, to weigh in on, on, uh, on that. Right. It's a great, it's a great, I think it's often an opportunity um, uh, in every discipline, every class to ask some of those big questions. Right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it may not be appropriate to talk about religious faith in the classroom in, in, in that way, but asking the big questions, I think is something that all of us should be invited to do and, and think about. Yes. And, you know, your, your expertise area is in math. And I think we have a, a, a common crossover in that I know in, and I forgive me if I mess up the turn, but <laughs> cause math is not my expertise area at all, but the Fibonacci sequence has that kind of spiraling, uh, spiraling diagram, right? That we see repeated over and over in, in biology, like the snail shell. And, mm -hmm. and, and we actually study that in design, just kind of the proportions, mm -hmm. you know, the, yeah proportions and kind of the golden rule and these proportions and and so it's just so interesting to observe God's you know it's so intentional right and and I'm curious to know more about various things in math that you've seen that have kind of reflected reflected God or just kind of the order or kind of maybe yeah. thinking of God or yeah yeah I mean I I, I think uh you know what? What you know, the way I like to talk about math, uh, doing math is really about the power to see hidden patterns, right? There's there's patterns that underlie everything that we see, uh, and uh, to do math well is to really begin to see the unseen, right? That's that's another way of putting it, right? See the the unseen patterns that lie uh, underneath everything we do. You know whether yeah. if that's a virus um, that's uh, that's uh, spreading exponentially. The math actually gives us the power to understand what exponential spread looks like, right? The differential equations gives us the ability to model um, uh, what is going to happen when you have, you know, different rates of uh, infection and different rates of um, uh, of, uh, um, of being cured of the disease, things like that. So uh, this is uh, the power to see hidden patterns is is huge, right? And so you know, part of the wonder and awe. For a, for a mathematician is when you see some of these patterns, they're really beautiful, right? They're really yeah. amazing. You know, I find it really uh, uh, wonderful that I, you know, I could have the same thought with somebody who separated from me by oceans, culture, and time. Uh, we could come up with the same proof of the same, you know, the same idea. Uh, that's, that's yes. kind of wonderful. That that leads you to think there's actually an underlying reality yes. uh, to uh, to to what you're doing, and it's not just a figment of my imagination. Right, it's an absolute truth, a, a fundamental truth. Yeah, absolutely. An underlying, yeah. So, like, um, uh, I, you know, I think uh, it was a uh, uh, Nobel Prize-winning physicist Eugene Wigner who talked about math's unreasonable effectiveness uh, yes. to explain things in the natural sciences. Yes. And, uh, and maybe it was Einstein who said, uh, who asked the question, like, how is it that, I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, how is it that um, something that we only think of in our minds can, can, can explain uh, what we see? Right? It's, uh, yeah. How can you access something like that? Like, what is, so this, this, the, these are all very, you know, interesting, wonderful um, things to realize when you begin to study now. Yes. Okay, we got to math, you know, with with the same kind of faith uh, perspective that I have. But almost everybody who does math 
sees math itself in some ways as um, uh, the a, a crucible that holds a lot of wonder and uh, and awe, right? Yes. And you know, for me as a as a believing Christian, I see uh, God's handiwork in that, and I find that a a, a way that I um, uh, come to God in, in worship. Mm. That is awesome. That is awesome. Speaking of God and and just kind of, there's a lot of questions about like like the third question down we have one of our questions from Yi Ming Wang is how do you understand the first chapter of Genesis? How can we reconcile the biblical descriptions of creation with modern science? Yeah, I have a lot of students wondering this same thing. So fantastic question, Yi Ming. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, I, first, first of all, I should say, you know, I, uh, I think there are lots of uh, views that Christians have, uh, com uh, committed Christians have about uh, uh, about uh, how to understand Genesis. Um, and I, you know, I, I, you know, and usually what people are asking often is, do you hold to some sort of literal six day creation, uh, or are you um, you know, are you, uh, do you believe that uh, the earth is old? And my, my own personal uh, opinion is that, uh, uh, in, is that the, the science uh, suggests that the earth is, is actually old. And I have no reason to doubt that. And uh, because I've seen multiple ways that, uh, that, that, it, that can be confirmed, or see, that the evidence points to that, right? In, in, our, in biology, in, our, in um uh, in archaeology, in astronomy, there are lots of different ways that you see this. So that's my own, uh, my own, uh, my own understanding brings into that. And I, I don't see any contradiction between uh, an old Earth and uh, and uh, the way that I read Genesis. I mean, Genesis. I think uh, if you take a look at it, you have to ask why was Genesis written uh, and, and uh, what was it written for. Uh, and I think if you look at it, it actually wasn't written to answer scientific questions. I think it was trying to to give an account uh, of um, of why, right? The why question: Why did God create uh, humankind? Uh, and so, I, I don't see a contradiction uh, between that and uh, my own scientific um, uh, view of an older. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the the. Big question for me in in this not question, but I would say like the question that I asked myself, and and the conclusion that it came from it from reading Genesis is really two camps. One, we could think that we were by chance, right? That we were the smattering of material and and <coughs> thrown together, and because of these combinations of things, and just given enough enough time that we've come out of this primordial, primordial soup and life appeared, right? Or there's the other camp, which is we were intentional. God designed us. He ordered things and had a plan and it was not chaotic, right? And for me, the Genesis answers that, that, that we were intentional and we were, we were made with purpose and design and there is an intelligent, intelligent designer behind all of this, you know, and so, that's what it, whether young earth or old earth, I think that is the big thing that, the big takeaway I get from Genesis is that, that we were intentionally made and not by chance anyway. I don't know if you're, any thoughts on that? Or yeah, yeah, I mean, and now of course we're, we're moving into more nuanced territory that, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot that, that uh, has been written and said about, uh, about that. I mean, I, uh, you know, one of the questions that often comes up is the question about, evolution right like yeah. how do you understand evolution and yes. uh, even you know for believers uh, uh there's a range of views even about evolution right so yeah. i mean I, I i don't have a problem with uh evolution describing uh the uh the progression of life uh in uh in biology uh and uh uh and uh, you know there is i i do see the um i don't see any incompatibility between that and, and the view that you um, that you take from uh, from uh, from Genesis about uh, intention uh, uh, yeah. at all, you know, so it brings up interesting philosophical questions, which I, I don't know that we need to to get into here. Um, 
But I, I, the other, uh, one of the things that I do take from Genesis as well is the fact that we're all made in God's image. And that, I think, is an important idea and concept that um, uh, is, you know, it's not, you know, you have to ask, what does it mean to be made in God's image? And, you know, I don't think being made in God's image means physically necessarily made in God's image. Um, and that would be uh, a strange thing to think about. But um, what I think what it does mean is that we are like God um, uh, 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 creatures of, of reason and um, uh, of wonder and glory. And uh, in, in many ways, you know, we have a responsibility to steward those kinds of things that God has given us for good. Right, they can be used for good or for evil. Um, uh, our minds, our science, can be used for evil, but they can also be used um, for the flourishing of, 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 of human of humankind. And uh, and we're moral agents. We we can make decisions that affect um, uh, affect uh, people's uh, lives and 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 uh, affect our own moral uh, inclinations. Yeah. So that, that's, you know, when I read Genesis, I understand that we're made in God's image. That is actually such an important idea because, you know, if you ask, if you think about a lot of the, the current questions about social justice, uh, about, uh, you know, it's really rooted in the idea of dignity. Where does our dignity come from? And, uh, you know, often, you know, there, that that's at odds with the idea that, like, you know, should we treat rich people better than poor people, right? You know, some people might, uh, in, in, on one hand, say, I believe in social justice and, and dignity for all. And on the other hand, you know, in, their, in, in our own private lives, in, in many ways, uh, we, we do things that are counter to that. And so part of the question you have to ask yourself is where does the idea of, of uh, equal rights come from? Where does the idea that we all have equal dignity? Uh, and, you know, I, I would I would. Uh, would would uh, say that uh, that str that strongly comes from um, this idea that that uh, and can only come from uh, an idea that we have a dignity outside uh, of who we are, uh, and that come it can only come from an external source. It would have to be God, uh, in some ways, is one way to think about it. That's one of the most compelling arguments for me uh, for the existence of God is uh, is the fact that we all have a, a certain moral sense that it's not right to kill other people. Uh, yeah. it, it's yeah. not right to treat uh, people differently uh, based on the color of their skin. Uh, and so if that's the case, then where does that dignity come from? It can't come from the color of our skin. It can't come from our pocketbook, how much money is in our wallet. It can't come from where we were born. Where does it come from? It has to come from an external source. And mm -hmm. where else would that be other than uh, uh, than God? So we're made in the image of God. That's the way I, that's the biggest thing I take away from Genesis. Yes, yes. Great. All right. How about we take another question here? We have, what does the Bible say about stem cell research? Is it against Christianity? Mm. Okay. Well, again, I'm, I'm not a biologist, but I will tell you what I, <coughs> excuse me, what I understand a, a little bit about stem cells. Is, I mean, I think there's, there's real concern, I think, to, to have about uh, certain kinds of stem cells. And this is you know, there, there are two, two kinds of stem cells. Uh, one is the embryonic kind, and one is adult stem cells. Uh, and, uh, you know, the embryonic kind, I think, causes, raises real concerns for, uh, for Christians who uh, are concerned that um, fetal tissue will be used uh, and people will be incentivized to, to, to produce fetal tissue that isn't going to result in, in, uh, in, in life uh, by harvesting fetal tissue in some way. And that, of course, should concern uh, concern us. Um, uh, uh, but uh, but adult stem cells, there are there there aren't uh, those similar concerns. And uh, I think science is now showing uh, many ways that uh, adult stem cells can be used. In fact, um, uh, for the purposes that were originally envisioned for for embryonic stem cells. And so, you know, I, I think we, I think we should all be very um, uh, amazed uh, and uh, inspired and welcome uh, the use of adult stem cells uh, because uh, you know, they they do hold a lot of promise for um, curing lots of um, medical diseases. Yeah. 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 I'm in agreement with you, Dr. Sue. That's great. How about we take another question here? 
And these kind of, it's a couple questions that are asking similar things. So maybe I'll just pair them together. We have one question saying, how do you, this is the next question right after the, the stem cell one. How do you in your profession share your faith, fulfill God's calling for you to make disciples? And the second one is similar. Dr. Sue, I loved your book. What ways have you found effective in sharing the gospel with fellow mathematicians and students? So it seems like they're asking about how do you make disciples? How do you share your faith? Yeah. Yeah, well, again, when I talk about sharing my faith, I, I think about it as communicating hope, right? What is the hope that we have uh, in Christ? And part of the, the um, uh, I think part of the, uh, the challenge and the opportunity in every context is to uh, ask, what is that hope? right? To remind ourselves of the hope that we have uh, and then be able to communicate that to others. So for instance, uh, you know, if you think a little bit about academics, you know, all, many of us here are students uh, and uh, one of the things that we prize in academia is uh, achievement, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, we all want to, you know, get the best grades, get into, get a great job or, or get into a profession that's seen as, as dignified, uh, uh, and um, get respect from others. That's a huge uh, idol in some sense. That's the, the word that, that uh, Christians might use is, you know, is, is a certain kind of thing that you go after at all other costs. Um, so achievement is, is, is huge. Um, it's a huge uh, source of uh, both pride, but it's also a source of concern, right? I mean, like, you know, um, it, everybody wants, you know, to have to live in a nice house and to to uh, to have a great job and have respect. And you know, part of the question you have to ask yourself is why? What is all that for? Right? I mean, if if all that happens at the end of life is that we live and we die, I think most people on their deathbeds aren't saying, "I wish I had more money." Right? They're often saying, "I wish I had been kinder to." Um, you know, my uncle or my sister or whatever it is, right? Like, um, what are the things that really matter? And um, and so, you know, part of the way that I, I think is I found helpful um, in academic circles is to help people see that the things that, uh, the, that they might prize uh, as ultimate goods uh, really aren't, don't uh, offer the promise that they, don't keep the promises that they make, right? Like, um, if you think getting a good job is going to make you happy, I, I think many, many people would find it that, that it doesn't, right? You're often chasing after the next thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Often if, if you're, if you're, you, you know, you're, if you have a nice house, you're like wanting the next nicer house, right? If you, uh, in academia, if you write a, you know, if you, if you, if you, you know, write a, a great paper, you're often like, well, I, you know, I'm now chasing after the next thing. And so when we do that, it distorts actually what the what the profession is supposed to be about, right? I'm supposed to be about wonder and discovery, and suddenly I'm about padding my resume. That's not healthy, and that's <coughs> often a source of deep distress. So the ways that I found most effective to talk about communicating the hope that I have is to point people to um, the importance. You know, in this case, you know, I've off, I've given a talk about grace that you can find on on YouTube that really tries to uh, explain the idea of what grace is to an academic audience, right? Yeah. The fact that um, your accomplishments are not where you get your dignity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's another way of pointing to the image of God, right? It's like saying, you know, your, your uh, dignity doesn't come from anything that you do. And the sooner that we realize that, the sooner that we recognize that, um, uh, the, the, the better, uh, the, the, the more, um, uh, satisfied we'll be with actually our jobs, right? Like, I'm not saying don't go out and achieve. I'm not saying don't go out and do good science. What I am saying is don't get your dignity from it uh, because otherwise you're gonna be striving more and more for things that aren't gonna make you happy. So that's that's a way that I've, I've found has, has been helpful. And then another way we've sort of alluded to as well is, is, is ha having people, helping people to ask the big questions, the deeper questions. Mm -hmm. So my recent book, um, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, isn't, you know, isn't a, a book about religion or anything like that. But I think what it really does is, is ask some of the deep questions, the bigger questions that underlie why we do math. Yeah. Why we ought to do math. I mean, that's part of the, <laughs> what, the, what the book is trying to communicate is, hey, you know, math actually taps into deep human desires that all of us have. 
desire um, for, for truth or for beauty, desire for freedom, a desire for community. Uh, and when math is done well, it actually can meet these desires. And, and, and that's true for almost any other discipline, right? You can ask in what ways do those disciplines meet the deep human desires that we have? Because we wouldn't actually be excited about doing them if, if they didn't actually meet some desires that um, that I would say are, 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 are God given. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's fantastic. And and how would you say like some of the one was the in terms of like making disciples or or um, sharing the gospel with fellow students and mathematicians or even maybe your like fellow professors? Is there things that tips or things that you do to try to do that? Yeah, again, I mean, I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, in, in terms of thinking about what it means to communicate hope, often those kinds of conversations have happened for me often when people are, are facing personal crises, um, nice. crises where, uh, where, which sort of take them out of, uh, out of the mode of just thinking about the next you know, the next thing going on in their day, but thinking about the big questions of life. Um, uh, yeah. and, and so those are off, have often opened up opportunities um, uh, to uh, talk about the gospel, talk about the gospel hope um, that we have. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. For me in my, in my own classes, I, I, the students, I don't, I don't kind of outright talk about God, but like I was saying earlier, a lot of the content, is already pointing to God, like the biomimicry class, or I teach another class on sustainability, and that that sustainability is is exactly how how God wants us to treat the world, right? With yes, respect to and the world. world, yes, yeah, to respect the earth and to and having this kind of circular economy where nothing is wasted, right? And 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 so those concepts are all biblical and then I can incorporate it into the teaching that I'm, you know, giving the students. So yeah. uh, it, it, all of this content can lead to other conversations. And then just like in terms of the way we run the classes, like we try to, I try to teach a lot of Jesus's mm, moral teachings, even in the class by having, having the students try to help each other help one another. I, I won't say love your neighbor as yourself, but I'll say help your fellow classmate. <laughs> you know, let's, yeah. let's look out for each other. Right. And we can, we can do that through our, through that way instead yeah. of being explicit, but. Yeah. And, and that's actually an important part of, uh, of uh, education, right. It's part of, it's part of the difference between um, uh, learning um, uh, from, from just from books. Right. Yeah. Or, or learning just from watching a lecture versus participating in a community, right? Yeah. This is a, an important fact, you know, it's important idea. I think it's also a very biblical idea that um, we're not just um, compartmentalized selves, right? There isn't an academic side of me uh, and uh, then another side of me, you know, the, the personal side, right? They're, they're, they're in some ways integrated, right? And, and that's, that's part of, uh, that's part of, uh, I think, um, what's compelling about the Christian um, notion of, of how we live. We live integrated whole lives, right? There isn't, yeah. um, there isn't the human and the divine separated, right? Somehow yeah. they are integrated, right? And we yeah. should live integrated lives. And, um, uh, and so, you know, as teachers, I think that's, that's huge. It's part of what you're emulating in your classroom as well is like, you know, you don't just turn off the personal side of you when you get to class, right? We're not like people aren't robots and you don't just open up their brains and then pour in information, right? Part of that learning has to take place in in places where people love each other through community, right? People care for each other. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's certainly ways I think we can emulate um, the love of, of God uh, in the classroom. Great. So we had this fantastic question yesterday that uh, one of the students asked, and I want to make sure that it gets answered because this person asked it. So Ying Xiao asked, as God creates Earth for us, shall we agree on exploring the universe and find another planet to live on? Will faith die if all transcendency is explained? Yeah, well, let's get the second one first. So the second one is, is this idea of God of the gaps, right? So, I mean, one thing I hope I 
didn't communicate in my talk about transcendency is that um, that faith is explaining the things that I can't explain through science, right? I think what I, I was hoping, my goal for the transcendency talk is to say, there's actually some things that are just outside the bounds of science, that science will, won't explain, will never explain. I can't hope to explain purpose. Uh, I, I know some will disagree with me on that. I think one of the questions asked something like that, like, is that really true that science won't explain purpose? Uh, uh, and, you know, there there's probably some nuance that we could have a nuanced discussion about that. But I think on the whole, um, uh, explaining why, uh, what the purpose of my life is, I don't think science is ever going to explain that. Or why it is that I love my wife and my son, uh, I don't think, I don't think science is going to explain that. You might give me a biophysical uh, description of what's going on in my body when I get good feelings about my family, but that's not going. That's very different uh, explanation than uh, than um, uh, helping me understand how I should live my life. Right. So that's uh, so I don't faith won't die if all transcendence is, is explained because uh, transcendency isn't going to be explained in that way. Right, I think mean, that's part of what I hope I can communicate. It. Um, but yeah, I mean, should we find another planet to live on? I, I, that would be wonderful if we found another planet. I think what would be, what would be horrible is if we uh, found a planet and then we trashed it, <laughs> which is what I think, uh, George, you, uh, your work is helping us think about. Well, let's not trash the planet we live on. Right. Like any yeah. other planet we discover. Yes. Yes. And and then okay, so that's great. This one is, okay, so we have several more questions and things in the chat. There's a lot of, lot of st stuff going on in the chat. I'm sorry, trying to multitask here <laughs> and uh, reading through a lot of these things. But maybe this one I think is, maybe, well, it's, it's not quite science and faith, but I think it's maybe an important one to touch on. One person asks, in light of your parents' illnesses, would you elaborate on your view of how a good, powerful God can exist when there's so much suffering in our world? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. It's a hard question. I mean, that's one of the questions that actually has come up in, in the carpool for me uh, uh, when a friend was talk, was was wrestling with um, uh uh, with a relative who had cancer, right? And you know, I I wrestled with that question as well as I described in my in my um, in my talk. And I, I think one of the things that that's hard. I mean, there's a whole chapter of the uh, of of the Bible that wrestles with this question, right? The Book of Job, right? Why are, why are all these horrible things happening? Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think one of the things that um, is interesting about Job and uh, that book, and also just in my own experiences. I, I don't know that God uh, ever answers Job uh, why he was suffering, right? But one thing that I, I do know uh, is that God walks with us in our suffering. And, uh, and that's, that's part of the powerful message of, uh, of the Christian hope is that we're not alone uh, in, our, in our struggles um, if, we, uh, if we allow Jesus to, to, uh, to, to inhabit that, right? And he, he, he suffered uh, on the cross uh, in ways that I think are not necessarily Im imaginable to us, but he, he understands suffering. And, um, uh, uh, you know, I think he's sometimes called the man of sorrows, right? Like, I think this is a huge part of, 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 of who God is, because God is, uh, is deeply, deeply loves us and deeply cares for us, right? Yeah. So that, that's to me, I think, the way that I think about suffering. Right? I, I don't try to explain why, why, why it is. Although others have, have written about it, right? C.S. Lewis has many books about this kind of thing. You know, you, you could ask, uh, why does God allow suffering? But the alternative, the alternative, uh, alternative view, uh, if there is no God, is 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 even more bleak, yeah, right? That's right. How do I understand suffering if there is no God? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't explain it, right? You you just have to take a hopeless attitude about it. Um, so um, I, I actually think that it's, uh, it's not the right question, not, ne not necessarily asking the, the right question to say, why does God allow suffering, but more a question of um, uh, what do we understand about, about the nature of the world through suffering, right? Is it, is it a godless world uh, or is it a, a world with God, who, a God who walks with us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we have some other. Oh, I, here. I'm just going to point out that I, I that uh, I think one of the chat questions is um, uh, why do you think there's a dichotomy between science and religion? Um, so that one many on on one side think it that they're both that they're exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. I mean, I I think one of the reasons is that there are people who who uh, advance this view, right? There are people of faith who uh, advance the view that that's, that science is against uh, people of faith, which uh, I which I I would say is not true at all. Um, but there are also people who um, uh, or who are not. Uh, be uh, believers who are uh, who are trained in science, who also say that you know people of of uh, faith uh, are against science, and that's also not true. <laughs> and so, um, I think it's it, it's a it's an easy way out for many people, right? I mean, I think um, part of of why we have this big dichotomy is because it's just easy to say, um, and maybe 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 feel threatened. Um, you know, if you have, uh, if you have one way of understanding the world, it can feel threatening to say, actually that, that explanation is incomplete in some sense. Right. So maybe, maybe that's one, one reason why people are, um, like to advance this view, but yeah. there's so many people of science, um, and faith who, you know, who are just examples of why this doesn't have to be the, the predominant view, right? There are many scientists throughout the the ages who have also been believers. Um, yeah. 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 There's uh, one quick question in the comment. Do plants and animals have dignity as well? Yeah. yeah that's a great question. I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm going to speak just for myself. I'm not speaking for all of Christendom for, uh, and, uh, and I also am not a theologian, but I, I would say that, Plants uh, and animals and and the rest of the world have a certain kind of dignity, but it's not dignity made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a result, this is why we should care about sustainability. We should treat treat the world uh, well. Yes, <coughs> they've been I given to us. Trying to say that that the way that God is, He said for us to take care of the animals, right? And He said for us to take care of the world and 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 keep it and be good stewards of it. So yeah, I, I agree that God wants us to respect the animals and the plants and everything around us. Yeah. yeah, okay. So we have another interesting question. The comment was in the Genesis one starts with in the beginning, but then later talks about the first day. So are there a diff is there a difference between those? Yeah, I, I, I think he, uh, the question is pointing to um, the difference between uh, Genesis one and Genesis two, perhaps, uh, and so you know, for me, that I think uh, that difference that you point out actually helps me understand why Genesis was written, right? Like, it, Genesis isn't intending to be a uh, a, a historical scientific account of uh, 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 of the world. This is this is Christians. Many Christians might disagree with this, but. Uh, 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 but that's, I think, part for, for me helps me understand there's a difference between the way Genesis 1 was written and the way Genesis 2 was written, and that helps me understand both of them. Yes. Okay. We have another question that was in the poll was, what does the Bible say about reproductive technologies? What does the Bible say about reproductive technologies? I'm I'm no expert on uh, either reproductive technologies or what the Bible says about it, so I think I'm going to have to pass on that. I, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, I think any time we're talking about uh, life and the uh, the creation formation of the human life, I think that's a, a question of of great uh, spiritual uh, concern and significance. Uh, I don't know that uh, I don't know any much about what the Bible. You know, I, I don't know that the Bible speaks specifically to that. I mean, this is true. There's lots of things I, that that are, are brought on uh, by the uh, uh, the advance of science that uh, theologians uh, and ourselves we're going to have to wrestle through, right? Um, what does the Bible say about search engines? What does Bible the Bible say about uh, the significance of uh, 
of algorithms that determine our fate, whether we get a, a job or whether we uh, get arrested or whether we, um, whether we get our next loan, right? Does the Bible say anything specifically about those things? Well, there's some general principles. Right? Yeah. I think the Bible talks about general principles of, of, um, of uh, not uh, defrauding your neighbor and uh, talks about general principles about the way we should treat each other, right? I mean, so I think, I think we have to, we have to, 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 um, to think about every new advance uh, in, uh, in the light. And that's not to say the Bible doesn't have anything to say, but, right. but it's not going to specifically talk about some of those things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We know that the Bible gives us wisdom and, and God also gave us a brain. <laughs> so we need to take yeah. that wisdom and think about it and ponder and yeah. talk about it. Yeah. In fact, I love the way you put that. I mean, that's, that's, that's really, that's, that's one of the most compelling ways of thinking about, you know, when God says, love the Lord, uh, we should love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yes. <laughs> the mind's in there for a reason, right? Yeah. We, right. we are not robots that need to follow, uh, that need to follow, like we, that, that's part of, you know, when people talk about, um, uh, often, you know, there's a, a question about, do I read the Bible literally? Well, I mean, what does literally mean? I mean, part of it is you have to ask, why was the book written? What was it written for? Right. I'm not, I personally, as a scientist, I'm not looking to Genesis to answer scientific questions. Right. Um, so, but do I take it literally? Yeah. I take it literally in the sense that, you know, it was intended. Right. Um, uh, you know, if, if I look at the song of, of songs, which is, is love poetry, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and the writer there says that you know your your um, your nose is like a tower of Damas uh, Damascus pointing tower of Lebanon pointing towards Damascus, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not taking that literally, right? <laughs> but I am. I do understand <laughs> the context it was it was made, right? It yeah. Was meant intended, right? So that's I take it literally, like you right. know, somebody fawning over their. Um, uh, they're beautiful, they're loved, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Okay, I think we can take one last question and then we can talk about some resources. Uh, there's a question about books and websites, but this next question is, what mathematical activities can we do to get to know more about God? Oh, yeah, well, um, I, I know mean, you, had, like, you have your like a website of like, I think like an app or something like that. Oh, there's, or a math web one facts. there's a math one facts website. Yeah. I mean, anytime you're using your mind to reason and to think you are, uh, you are being a, an active, you're actively um, learning about God because you're learning about the way your mind works. Right. And um, the way you reason uh, you're made in the image of God. This is, you know, God is a God of, of, um, of reason and, um, and order, you know, um, so in, in beauty, right? Like, you know, whenever you experience a, a wonderful mathematical idea or concept, that's, that's a glimpse into, uh, a very pure form of beauty. Uh, and yep. that's, uh, I think attractive as well. Um, so yeah, so I, this, this is me rambling. What, what was the question again? What, what do we learn? What How do we learn God through mathematical God? activities can we do to get to know more about God? Yeah, the, yeah. Think, reason, um, uh, learn about some of the beautiful mathematical ideas that are out there. You don't have to know much math to learn about those ideas. And for that, I would, you know, I'd point to some popular books that you might uh, look at. Um, uh, yeah. People often like, you know, as kids, you share puzzle books with your kids. You know, puzzles are a good source of wonder and, and delight um, if, you, if you're into that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll end with talking about some resources like books and websites because there was a question at the very top of the poll, which was, are there any books or websites that we can recommend to further explore the topic of faith and science? So. Yeah. Is there any specific books or websites that that you think gotta check this out? This is so yeah. important. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it might be uh, it might be self serving to point out that I have this book uh, called Mathematics for Human Flourishing that uh, 
that um, you might you might take a look at. I mean, in some ways, it's it's my best uh, effort at uh, trying to open people up to the um, the, the the wonders uh, of mathematics uh, and also how they 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 sit very deeply uh, uh, with um, many of the 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 human and spiritual concerns that we have, right? Concerns uh, for uh, love and justice and uh, and other uh, and other things, right? Um, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot. But many of the questions I think we're centering around just you know some of the the questions about science and um, faith, specifically yeah. around origins. Yeah. So one book that I, I really like is a book uh, by uh, Dave and Kate Vosberg called Jesus, Beginnings, and Science. Okay. Uh, what it does is it tries to help people look at scripture and what it has to say about the origin question. Uh, okay. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, give answers as much as it, as it raises questions and discussion. So you can use that as a discussion guide uh, for a group study. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it gets, it gets to some of these questions, like having you think through about what Genesis 1, Genesis 2 say, uh, and as well as other, uh, passages in the Bible that talk about origins. So I'd recommend that. Um, awesome. Uh, yes. And generally about faith and science, I would say John Polkinghorne, uh, any book by John Polkinghorne is, is going to be a book that, um, addresses uh, questions related to faith and science. So for those of you who don't know, Polkinghorne is a scientist, but also, um, well-known as a uh, as a as a uh, theologian as well, and uh, and so you know some of the stuff that he's written is is a little is is actually you know kind of heady you know in some ways it's it requires a little bit of uh, intellectual investment but you know I, I think I was helped when I read some of the stuff he said about miracles like how can a, a scientist believe in miracles um, so, so his books on science and religion touch on questions like that. Um, Another book that uh, I'd recommend is Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health. You know, one of the guys who's, who's actually thinking very hard about how we stop this pandemic. Mm. Uh, uh, Anthony Fauci's boss. Uh, he's a, a, a well-known uh, Christian as well. He, he wrote wow. a book called The Language of God. Uh, okay. And he talks about his journey, but he also talks about how we understand some of these new technologies and um, uh and DNA and things like that. You know, he, he was head of the Human Genome Project. For, wow. For wow. Yeah, he has a book called Language of God, uh, a bestseller, which I'd recommend uh, as well. Those are, those are just some thoughts I'd throw out. Oh, that's that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So I, I, I also have some resources that have helped me in my own personal journey and, and trying to understand science and faith and so this first one here is called Not By Chance. This one is written by Lee Spetner. And basically he talks about just the evidences, you know, evidence like DNA and, and some of the more, more recent discoveries that just point to intelligence, intelligent design that again, we're not here by chance, but it's ordered and there's, there's intention. And just by observing that it's, it's not chaotic, but it's very, very much organized. And then, so very, very interesting. He has this, he's PhD in physics from uh, MIT and taught at Johns Hopkins, very smart guy. Definitely encourage you to check it out. And then he has another, he has another book, uh, another book called Evolution Revolution Thinking. And I haven't, I don't own that one personally, but I think I'm gonna order that one. And so that one is speaking similarly in, in that, vein that he's talking about with through not by chance and then there's a series called the intelligent design yeah that's the book right there evolution revolution and there's a series called the intelligent design collection and so i got a couple of these right here and these represent the two out of the three of them i'm holding so one's called the privileged planet and the other one's called uh, darwin's dilemma and so Privileged Planet is really amazing. This one just really talks about how unique our, our planet is and that it couldn't be, by, even if we were off by a degree and a half in our axis of tilt of the world, we would either be two, or I think it's two degrees or one and a half degrees uh, that we would either burn up or it would be a frozen ice age, right? So it's like, 
so specific the way that 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 things are arranged and and i believe that god arranged them to be specific that we would be able to sustain life and and so this really goes really into depth into into some of those those specific details about how amazing the earth is and then this one darwin's dilemma very very i enjoyed this quite a bit and this is kind of just really talking about how darwin himself really struggled particularly with the idea that not the idea but what he observed that the had we have the before the cambrian period we had not so many we had more single-celled organisms than these and according to his theory, it would be kind of a slow development and, and slowly see, gradually see many more, many more species. But that's not what we find in the fossil record. We see an explosion. They call it the, the Cambrian explosion. And we see thousands upon thousands of, of new species being formed very quickly. And then, but with, with very complex things like eyes and articulated limbs and and moving and moving parts that cannot could not have evolved so quickly so that was Dar that's darwin's dilemma and just mm -hmm. talking more about those details which is quite interesting yeah by the way i forgot um so you, you were mentioning many, uh, a lot of resources related to intelligent design um one uh, another resource that i should mention is a website by francis uh by biologos yeah. Which is, uh, uh, so th it takes the view which which is more aligned with uh, with my view about uh, God using evolution to uh, to create the world. Uh, yeah. But one thing that's great about BioLogos, uh, the website, is that there's uh, there's just lots of articles there about a range of topics. Right, you could look look uh, at articles written uh, about uh, stem cells and other things, uh, and that's at BioLogos.org. So uh, I, I recommend that as a website as well. Awesome. So we are out of time, unfortunately, but we've, we've just really enjoyed our time. We hope you guys have enjoyed it as well.